new proclamations. What wise men, great men, medical men, professional people have not been able to do, God will do it. All those things that are forgotten, your forgotten strength, your forgotten power, your forgotten revelation, everything you said, I had a dream long ago. And I thought, this is what I will do. I've forgotten now, your forgotten vision will come up again. Passion will come up again. Revelation will come up again. New life will come up again in your life in Jesus' name. Only Christ Jesus has the power of this new year. An unforgettable encounter beckons. We are connecting to the God of wonders this new year for salvation and deliverance. Welcome GCK to Asaba. Delta State, Nigeria, January 26th to 31st, 2023. 1600 hours GMT daily and Global Sunday Worship at or 700 hours GMT. Also featuring ministers and professionals conference with Impact Academy for Youth, Young Adults and Young Professionals. It's a new year of wonders this 2023. From the Niger Delta, the oil of anointing will be transported by satellite and all our social media links to over 150 countries of the world. Join the team in GCK audience as the man appointed by God, the convener of GCK, Pastor Dr. W.F. Komoi, connects the world to an unforgettable encounter with the God of Wonders. Glorious music ministrations by choirs from nations across the world with guest music ministration by Jonathan Lee. Darkness gone. Yeah. Premature death cancelled. Yeah. Yours is now to reap the benefit. GCK, the, the gospel, gospel to every creature. Let us pray. Mighty God, Father of light, we come to you now, approaching your word, asking that you will grant us light from above, to understand, and to see, and to know the very will and the very mind of Almighty God. Almighty God, we are praying that as to show us in the gospel, the truth and the light, we pray that you will grant us the grace and the spiritual strength to follow through and to be obedient to your word in Jesus' name. Lord, we bless you that we know you will do this very thing so that our lives will come more into conformity with the totality of your word in Jesus' name. Help the young believers, help the old timers, that we all will have the right attitude to your word, be willing to learn, eager to learn, delight in learning the word of God, and then eager and delight in obedience to your word. Thank you, Lord. Be with us today as we learn, as we receive, and as we continue to meditate upon the word. In Jesus' name, we pray. We have come to the study of the word of God again. So those who are new converts and newcomers are in our midst, we want to emphasize that our Bible study is something we hold very significant. It's very significant to the life of the believer because it is this word that grants us, that grants us the light in the darkness of the world. The Bible says that no man knows his heart. No man knows the very condition of his inward life, except as the word of God will come to throw light upon the corners and upon the secrets of the heart. Therefore, as we come before the Lord every Monday like this, to listen to the word of God, we encourage each one to bring his Bible, to bring a pen or biro along, so that you can mark your Bible, you can jot down things in the Bible, and then as you receive the outline, you may want to write some little, little notes on the sides of the outline to remind you of the interpretation and of the application that we're making in the Word of God. Not only that, after you have learned, when you get back home, 
it will be good practice for you to go over it again so that this word will become part of you. Not only the new converts or those who are new among us, the old timers as well, should look into the word of God and take the word of God seriously, as seriously as we took the word in years gone by. We're still in Colossians chapter 3. And last week, we studied verses 1 through to 4. Just for you to get a feel of how this leads to verse 5, verse 6, and verse 7. Let me read again from verse 1 to remind you of what we have covered already. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ seated on the right hand of God. I need to remind you that I said last week that in the original Greek, this means, since ye have been risen with Christ, that is, already it is taken for granted that you are born again. You have been identified with Christ. You are crucified with Christ, dead with Christ, buried with Christ. Now you have tasted of the resurrection power. And since you are risen with Christ, there is only one thing for you to do. Seek those things which are above. That is, as your head is pointing heavenward, let your mind, let your heart, let your affections, let your ambition, let your desires point to things above. Your feet only touching the ground. Let that be the part of you that touches the ground. Let it be the least part of you, if, I'm, if I can make an illustration. You see the soles of the feet. If you will calculate the proportion of the soles of the feet with all the other parts of the body, you will see it's a very minute area, insignificant area. That means don't let the earth occupy the major part of your life. Let only your feet touch the earth, but then let your affection, your desires, Every other thing you have, let your desires point heavenward. Hold the things of this world with a loose hand, so that at the sound of the trumpet, you'll be willing to leave any time. Then it says in verse 2, Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. That means meditate on things above. You see, love or affection is something that comes out of thinking or meditation. You think about husband and wife. The love in the, in the midst or the love that is between the husband and wife will increase as they think of one another, as they meditate on the good parts or good points of one another, as they appreciate one another. The same thing, your love for God, your desires after God, your affection for God will increase as you think, as you meditate. As you set your desires and ambitions on things above, not on things on the earth. There are many things on the earth that try to get our attention. In the days in which we live now, politics is a major thing. Trying to get our attention, remember, that's part of the things on earth. Business, getting money, getting the things of this world, even education. You see now, everybody is thinking of education. Adults want to be educated. Even adults who need to be serving the Lord, working for God, they want to go for adult literacy class. And the young people, too, everybody is preoccupied with education. May I remind you, education is also one of the things on earth. How shall we eat? How shall we dress? What shall we put on? How shall we build house? Shall we have vehicle? How shall we have this or that? Let me remind you, all those material things are things on earth. You set your affection on things above, not on things on earth. May I also say, position, position of authority in society. When I say position, whether in the church or outside the church or in the world, being a bishop, that's only in the world here. Even though you may be a bishop and then do something spiritual, the position itself, the position itself, is something of the world. It's something that happens here. We don't carry Bishop Brick into heaven. 
the position, the authority that a person has, and he'll go around saying, I am this, I am that. When we get to heaven, all that will matter is that we're living a life above sin, living the overcoming life. Then in verse 3 it says, ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. You are dead, dead with Christ, and therefore you have been identified with the Lord. Now your life is hid with Christ in God, and is coming back. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Now in verse 1, it talks about the right hand of God. In verse 2, it talks of above, things above. In verse 3, it talks of your life being hid with Christ in God. That means in heaven, because already you know, Christ is in heaven with God. And then it talks about glory in verse 4. Everything is pointing our attention upward. Then Paul the Apostle comes to verse 5. And he tells us there are some things in this world that will try to negate or pull you down and will not allow you to obey completely. Verses 1 through to 4. And he says you must deal ruthlessly against those things. Deal with them ruthlessly. How do you deal with them? So that they do not pull you downward. They do not make you to backslide. They, don't want, they, don't, uh, they will not make you to look back. Verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. It's been talking of heaven, things above, setting your affections there, your life hid with Christ. Christ is going to appear. We will appear with him in glory. Then it says, how about the earth? Any problem with the earth? Any problem with things down below? Oh, it says, yes. There are some things down below here. And there is one thing you have to do about them. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. What are they? Fornication. Uncleanness. Inordinate affection. Evil concupiscence. Covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience in the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. Today, we're looking at this passage, and very clearly you can see why we make the title The Death of the Old Life. Death of the Old Life. God's work of grace in our heart makes us dead to sin. Already, if you have been studying the Bible for some time, you know that. To live up to the privilege we have in Christ, the privilege of our position in Christ, we have to mortify the sins of the old life. That means we have to put to death the sins of the old life. To mortify means to kill. To put all these evil things out of our lives. The scripture is there calling us to eradicate, eliminate every sin from our lives that is against God. Think about that for a moment. Look at your life and make sure that if there is anything in your own life that is against the word of God, against the desires of God, you eliminate them, put them to death, mortify them. That means we must make definite effort to mortify the deeds of the flesh. We must deal with self-centeredness we must deal with private, inner, inward desires contrary to the word of God. And we must deal with personal ambitions in a radical, ruthless way. To start with, let us see point one, the flesh and its members. And then point two, reasons for mortification, for putting to death all those deeds of the flesh, the flesh and its members. Look at verse 5 again. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Mortify therefore. Kill therefore. Destroy therefore your members which are upon the earth. When the Bible or when the New Testament in particular uses the word flesh. Flesh. It is used in the sense of the old man. The carnal sinful nature. And the members of that old nature, 
are the deeds of the sinful nature. The believer is there commanded to deal with particular past sins so that sin will no longer have dominion over him. And the list of those sins are given here and they represent a major part of the sins in people's lives or they represent the major part of the works of the flesh and they are to be dealt with. You deal with the acts of sin and you deal with the wrong desires towards sin. Let's look at Romans chapter 8 verse 13 and see the commandment of the Lord for the children of God. Romans chapter 8 verse 13 if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Now over here, the word flesh is mentioned. And the word body is mentioned. For new believers, we need to tell you that this is not referring to your literal body. Your hands and your feet or your tongue, or your eyes, or your ears that you can see. Because if you mortify, if you kill the members of your literal body, that doesn't set you free from sin. Let's say a person says, my hand has been stealing. I cut off the hand literally. That doesn't take the stealing desire away from the heart. Or maybe you say, your ears have been hearing things that you feel that they shouldn't be hearing. And then you cut off the ear. That doesn't stop you from desiring sin inwardly. Or maybe you will say, your legs have been walking through and going to questionable places. Maybe you say, I'll cut off my leg. Cutting off your leg will not set you free from sin. The sin is still coming out of the carnal nature. What then does this mean? It means the body here represents the inward man. Or it represents the old simple nature. Or it represents the carnal nature in man. And the deeds of the body are the works of the flesh. They are the things that are contrary to the word of God. And it says you will need to mortify them. You will need to destroy them. You will need to put them out of your life. Let's look at Galatians chapter 5. From verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Again, remember, this means the deeds of the old man, the deeds of the carnal nature, the activities of the sinful inner man. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. What then are we to do to these works of the flesh? Verse 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with their affections and the Lord. That means we're to put them to death. In Ephesians chapter 5 from verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Fornication, all uncleanness, or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. That is the character of saints of God should be that any of these things should never be mentioned in our midst. And I want you to think about this now. The people we know in Bible days, 
that really served the Lord. These things were not mentioned, no, not once in their lives. Today you find in many churches that you find people of position in the church, people of authority in the church, people of great privilege in the church, many churches. You find that these things are mentioned in their lives. But you check up, when God called leaders in those days, he made their lives clean, made their lives holy. Think about Moses. Could you hear about fornication, uncleanness, covetousness? Think of Joshua. Could you hear of fornication, uncleanness, covetousness? And you think of the prophets of old. Could you hear of all these things in their lives when you come on to the New Testament in particular? The New Testament people that were washed in the blood of the Lamb, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Could you hear in any of the apostles, any of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, fornication, uncleanness, covetousness? What a pity today that sometimes you will have a bishop, sometimes you will have an archdeacon. Sometimes you will have a person of great position in some denominations and you hear of fornication, uncleanness, or you will hear of covetousness. Let's leave the other churches. Let's come to our own church here. You know, if we are really a Bible church that we ought to be, we should never hear of fornication among the leaders in the fold. We should not even hear of fornication, uncleanness, or covetousness among the rank and file of workers and leaders in the church, of members in the church. But you know, it's very sad if you hear that a coordinator is caught in adultery or fornication, that a zonal leader caught in adultery or fornication, that a woman representative, what a terrible thing, could be caught in fornication or adultery. Or it's a very sad when you can hear that somebody who has been known in the church or somebody who is really a member of the church who is a worker in the church. You hear of fornication and uncleanness. And of course, you know what we do when we hear such a thing? We discipline such a fellow. In fact, without even disciplining them, they themselves ought to know they should not be in the work of the Lord. But what shocks me as a pastor what makes me very sad as a pastor is when somebody has committed fornication, then you discipline that individual, and then after one week, the fellow is coming back, I feel like preaching, the fire is burning within me, I've confessed all that sin, and one week now I've been waiting upon the Lord, everything is settled, it shocks me that somebody who has been in such a sin will be eager to preach. And if you don't restore them in one week or two weeks, they want to go and start another ministry. They want to go and do this and that. My friend, did you hear of anybody in the New Testament that committed fornication and was rebuked in the church and then will go and say, I will start another ministry? God will not back the ministry of the fornicator up. God will not back up the ministry of an unclean fellow, a covetous fellow. If you want to get to heaven and you know that you have done something wrong and you know that you have been caught in sin, even if nobody has seen you but you know that the Lord has seen you, sit down and settle your life with the Lord. Even if you, never, if you are never allowed to preach in this church, even if you are never allowed to be a worker in this church, you say, oh Lord, I want to remain a child of God and I want to make heaven. If you can just forgive me and make me go on my way to heaven, and follow the path of righteousness. Come back to this verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Let me remind you of the uh, Sunday worship yesterday. Let me remind you of that perplexing question. Lord, are there few that be saved? As you look at the world around you today, and you look at that question, Lord, are there few that be saved? Well, you will have to realize. Because you see many people in many churches, and maybe some people even in our church here. This church is not even an ex exception. If you look at the church, and you look at the lives of many people, fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, and it says it should not be one's name among the saints of God. And you see the, a lot of people that are dirty. Look at verse 4. 
neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather the giving of thanks. Verse 5, For ye know, for this ye know, that no armonger, nor covetous person, nor unclean person, who is an idolater, shall ask any, any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. I still look at all this, and you look at the dirty lives of very many people. Many people that are saying, I'm a child of God, I am saved, I am born again, I'm on my way to heaven. And you see all the things they're doing. You will have to still ask yourself that perplexing question. Lord, are there few that shall be saved? And the answer is, there are few. You already had that yesterday. Think about it. Meditate upon it. Now, what are the members that the Lord is saying? We should crucify. The Lord is saying we should mortify. The Lord is saying we should exterminate, eliminate, put out of our lives. Now, Colossians, let's look at it from verse 5. Chapter 3, verse 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Number one, fornication. Number one, that you are to mortify, that you are to kill that you are to bury, that you are to cover up underneath the earth, completely killed and destroyed and buried, that will never be in your life again. Number one, fornication. Let me stop here for a moment. You see in some churches, they never, never mention the word fornication. You see, I mean gospel churches. I mean churches that say they know the truth. I mean churches that preach salvation. Even some of them that say they preach sanctification. Even some of them that say they preach the baptism in the Holy Ghost. They say fornication is such a dirty word, a preacher must never mention it. They say fornication is such a delicate thing that a preacher must never mention it. They say you must be careful as a preacher. If you knock fornication, the devil is going to bring a great temptation to fornication your way yourself. And if you are fond of preaching against fornication in every message and every time, you must be very careful because the devil may run after you with that very fornication. But let's check up with the word of God. And let us see, you know, in that passage I have read to you, the very first word that is mentioned is fornication. Let's go back to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. We're looking at the very word of Jesus Christ now from verse 21. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders. Stop there. Jesus Christ talking about sin and talking about the things that defile the men, the heart of men. He first of all talks about evil thoughts because everything starts from the inward part. Everything starts from the inner man. What's the next thing he mentions? Adultery. What's the next thing he mentions after that? Fornication. Can you see that? The very first group of sins that Jesus knows, that he mentioned, and he said, all these evil things will destroy and will make you, will defile the man. And he mentions fornication. Now, if the Bible is so clear about it, how about we believers today? Why don't we stress and emphasize the same thing? Let's look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness. That's general term. Now, it goes into the specifics. What are the specifics? Number one, fornication. Do you see that? Why then do people say we should never mention that word? We should be silent about it. We should never warn people against it. You see the very first word mentioned there, fornication. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators. You see the first word mentioned there? Neither fornicators. You see, the word of God is very clear. The word of God is very plain. And it talks about fornication. 
and talks about it very clearly. And he warns the believers against it that we should never go into such a thing. Let us look at Galatians chapter 5 again, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? What are they? Adultery, fornication. You see the first group of words that are mentioned. Adultery, fornication. Let's now come back to our passage. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Mortify therefore. Members, your members which are upon their fornication. Mortify therefore. Get rid of this therefore. Your members which are upon the earth. And the very first thing he mentions is fornication. How do you destroy fornication? How do you get rid of fornication? Number one, you will repent in tears. You will repent in agony. You will repent with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. You will repent prostrate in the sight of God, saying, O oh Lord, I know that fornication is a terrible sin. It will drag me to hell. It will make me not to be able to see the face of God. And I repent in dust and ashes, with real contrition and conviction in the heart, with real agony and tears. You repent of the fornication. And you ask the Lord to forgive you, to cleanse you, to wash you, to make you totally, completely clean. Not only that, immediately you do that, you will ransack your house. You will check up every box in your house, every drawer in your house, and you will check up everywhere you have letters from the girlfriend, from the boyfriend. Letters that have been written, pornographic things, and magazines, and pictures that will get your mind back into fornication and adultery again. You will check up all those things, you will burn them. Not only that, if there is a girlfriend, if there is a boyfriend that is still waiting somewhere, that even though now you say you are born again, you say you are a child of God, immediately this girlfriend comes back, you will not be able to stand. You will cut off that girlfriend or boyfriend, that same partner. You will cut off that prostitute. You will cut off that lady that will always be coming whenever your wife is not around. You will make sure that you tell her, I am now a child of God. All those secret things I've been doing, which are not according to the will of God, I have repented. What if it's a person you cannot cut off? What do you mean? You mean the person is a maid, and you cannot cut off that maid? Why can't you cut her off? If it is a maid, that every time your wife is not around, she will come again, and then she will be mincing and rolling her eyes, and be talking in a silly manner, talking in a way that will get you back into adultery and immorality. You cut her off, you tell her to leave your house, and if your wife, not knowing what has been happening, will say, hey, why are we uh, driving away this maid? How are we going to be able to do all the house, uh, all the house chores and all the household things? If we drive this maid away, you say, no, she must go. She must go. If this house is going to have the peace of God, if this house is to be clean, if this house is to be able to make it at the time of the rapture, that maid must go. Or it may be, you say, but the person I have the problem with is my secretary in the office. Well, do something about it. Do something about it. Either you will live for her or she will live for you. You have to pass one way or the other. Or you say it is somebody in the house that uh, we're living, we live in room and parlor. And she lives in another room and parlor. And whenever people are not around or whenever it's dark, this lady will come and then you fall into sin again. Either you will leave that house or she will leave the house with you. You must cut off one way or the other. Now it says, put to death, mortify, destroy the fornication. There are other things that may pull your mind, that may draw your mind to fornication and to immorality. It may be that you have been going to film show, cinema houses, and all these cinema things are making you to think of immorality. You know what you do? You are going to cut off that thing. That television show or that cinema, that film, that pornographic magazine, you are going to burn it, get rid of it in your life. That is how to destroy, how to mortify your members which are upon the earth. Now wait a minute. You say it's not even something that I can easily cut off like that. You say when you are walking on the street and you see some of these ladies, 
the way they dress, the way they comport themselves, or the way they behave in the bus, or the way they are almost half naked, and you just look that direction that you cannot resist. You keep on looking, you keep on looking, you keep on looking until your body is inflamed, and you get into trouble. Well, you need to do something about it like Job did about it many, many, many years ago. In Job chapter 31, Job chapter 31, verse 1, I have made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? That's the consecration. That's the commitment. That is the covenant of a person that wants to make heaven at all costs. You see, if you are going to make heaven, you are going to make an effort. You are going to endeavor to do something about it. You cannot just make heaven by saying, Lord, I am weak. I am sinful. There's nothing I can do about it. Anytime temptation comes, I fall. Help me. I still want to make heaven. Ah, we don't make heaven like that. The kingdom of God from the time of John the Baptist until now. The kingdom of God suffered violence. And the violence take it by force. This is the fight of faith. And the Bible says, Fight the good fight of faith and deal with that thing. Deal with fornication. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Mortify therefore the members, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness. Now he talks of uncleanness. Uncleanness here refers to filthy thoughts, filthy intention, or daydreaming. Do you know there are some people? Whenever believers, fellow believers are not around, they will take a magazine. That magazine that has naked women, a picture in there. They will take a magazine, the kind of magazine that they will open. And then if a believer is coming, or even somebody who knows them, if that person is coming, then they will open the next page where there is no bad picture. Who are you deceiving? Heaven knows your life. Heaven knows your state of mind. Heaven knows that you still enjoy things that are dirty. And then eventually, when you, all these pictures, some people, some of these are profligate, some of the people that are so dirty, very, very dirty. They even have some of these are pictures, bad, bad, bad pictures uh, on their bed. And they will have the pictures all around their room. Or they will even have the pictures around their shops, on their windows, where they are selling things. Now they are so dirty that they carry all the pictures about, they cannot live except the pictures are there. Some of these people are so bad that they will even print the picture on their vest. They will print the picture, the picture on their clothing. And then as they're going about, they're showing all these evil things. It says uncleanness. When you allow all those evil thoughts, all those unclean thoughts to be going on in your mind, and you are not seeing them, and you are meditating on them, and you are thinking on them, and you are enjoying them, that is uncleanness, then inordinate affection, lost, or affection displaced, evil concupiscence as well, all these things that are of the flesh, the strong evil fleshly desires, and also covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness, which is idolatry. It says, mortify this thing. Get rid of this thing. Point two, what are the reasons for mortification? Why are we to get rid of these things? Verse 6 and verse 7. For the which things sake, the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. The word of God says one reason. Why we are to mortify them, kill them, destroy them, put them away from our lives, is because the wrath of God, the judgment of God, will come upon the children of disobedience because of these evil things. See, God's wrath is a current discipline, the present discipline that God brings upon sinners and backsliders. The consequences of sin are very great and very heavy. Even in this world, God's chastisement on fornicators, God's chastisement on adulterers, God's chastisement on polygamists, God's chastisement on the sea, God's chastisement on on the unclean, on the lascivious, on the covetous, is very definite and unmistakable. God always reacts against sin. If God sees sin in the life of an angel, he will react against it. Did you hear that? 
If God sees sin in the life of an angel, no matter the angel, even the archangel, God will react against it. And if God sees sin in the life of a bishop, in the, in the life of an archbishop, in the life of anyone, no matter how high, in the church or in the denomination, God will react against that sin. And if God sees sin in anyone, any believer, anyone, the wrath of God will come upon that individual. The wrath of God is the constant, never-changing, ever-present reaction of God against sin. And eventually, there will be everlasting punishment awaiting those who die in sin, those who refuse to repent until the very day of death. It says, the wrath of God. The wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. You know, some people, they will leave a church like this. They would say that standard is too high. Every, when somebody has said, gone wrong in marriage, they discipline him. When somebody has committed fornication, they discipline him. When somebody has stolen, they will discipline him. When somebody becomes a deceiver, a liar, he comes under discipline. I don't want a church like that. That's what they say. I, I want a church like that. But they say, I don't want a church like that. Then they go to another church where fornicators are not disciplined. Adulterers are not disciplined. Covetous people are not disciplined. Heady, stubborn, self will self-centered people are never disciplined. They say, that's the church they like. That's the church they like. You see, that kind of church will deceive you and make you to perish eventually because you'll be going on and on and on until God will leave you to your reprobate mind and eventually you will perish. But let's look at the word of God. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Reading from verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Fornicators, the wrath of God is revealed against all fornication unclean people, dirty people that will be having dirty thoughts and dirty life. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men. Covetous people, robbers and thieves. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, against all unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. There are some people that may even know the truth of the gospel. They have the doctrine of the gospel. But then they hold that doctrine in unrighteousness. And they'll have a way of excusing their sin. Excusing their evil deeds. The wrath of God is very definite on such people. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. From verse 8. For the fearful and the unbelieving... And the abominable, and the murderers, and all mongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second day. You see hell fire there. I wonder how you, living in sin, living in immorality, can feel convenient, knowing that Christ will come at any time, knowing there is a step. Between you and death. You know, sometimes a person who calls himself a believer and has a vehicle will pick a lady by the way and in the vehicle will be thinking of evil and talking of evil and touching that lady in an evil way with fornication, immorality, uncleanness in the ass. You know, when you are like that, honestly, you will not be able to drive properly. And you know, easily a person like that can have accident. And you can die right there on the road with a lady by your side and with you misbehaving and fumbling with the body of that lady and eventually you die. You know, in the world in which we live now, life even seems uncertain. There are people that sleep in the night. They don't wake up the following morning. There are people that, you know, from sleep, they just, they just pass away. What if you're living a deceitful life? What if you're living a, an hypocritical life? 
fearful of obeying the word of God, unbelieving the standard of holiness and the word of God, abominable and covetous and unclean and fornicating and having adultery in your life, sorcerers with evil spirits and demonic spirits and familiar spirits, and you are murderers, you kill with your tongue and you worship idols, and you are a liar, you are a deceiver. What if you die? What if you die? And people will think that you are a brother, you are a sister, and you die like that. Where will you go? The Bible says the lake of fire. Will you not repent today? Will you allow the warnings of God to just pass by your ears without you calling upon the Lord and repenting? Look at verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter into the city of God above anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Today let me ask you, is your name in the book of life? I don't mean, are you evangelizing? That's another thing. I don't mean, are you bringing other people to church? That's another story. I don't say, are you giving your tithes and your offering to the church? That's another story. What I'm saying is, are you living right? Are you a child of God? Are you born again? Is your life written in the book of life in heaven? Are you holy? Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Are you free from fornication? Are you free from uncleanness? Are you free from lasciviousness? Are you free from covetousness? Are you free from idolatry? Is your name in the book of life? Tonight is another opportunity to call upon the name of the Lord. Forget that you are a member of the choir, call upon the name of the Lord. Forget that you are an usher, call upon the name of the Lord. Forget that you are a worker, call upon the name of the Lord. My friend, forget that you are a coordinator, a zonal leader, a woman representative. Call upon the name of the Lord. I want to remind you that the word coordinator is not in the Bible. We just use that. Zonal leader, not in the Bible. We just use that. And therefore, that thing does not matter in the sight of God if you're an adulterer, if you're a fornicator, if you're unclean, if you have sin in your life. For this cause, the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. What are you to do? You have to cry to the Lord. You have to call upon the Lord. And you have to mortify. You have to destroy the deeds of the flesh so that if the trumpet will sound at any time, you'll be able to go with the Lord. Rise up now. Rise up now. Pray to the Lord. Forget your position, forget your authority, forget all the privileges you have in the church and outside the church. Call upon the name of the Lord, so that if the Lord shall come at any time, if the Lord shall come at any time, if the Lord shall come at any time, you will be ready. You will be ready. Aren't you ashamed that there is adultery in your life, fornication in your life, uncleanness in your life? How do you feel before God that you say you are born again, and yet all these things are there? Call upon the name of the Lord. Say, Lord, have mercy upon me. Lord, have mercy upon me. Lord, have mercy upon me. Let him cleanse you. Let him purge you. Let him change your life. Let him transform your life. Mortify your members which are upon the earth. Before God in prayer now, mention the name of that girlfriend and say, Lord, that girlfriend will have to go. Before God in prayer now, mention the name of that boyfriend and say, Lord, Lord, help me. That boyfriend will have to leave my life. Before God mentioned all those magazines, all those pornographic things, all those film shows that are bad, mention them before God and say, Lord, they will have to go, they will have to leave my life. Repent, forsake every evil way and call upon the name of the Lord. Don't allow anybody to call you to any meeting, keep on praying. Don't allow anybody to distract your attention, keep on praying. Talk to the Lord in prayer until there's a total change in your life. And you know once again, you have the assurance your name is written in the book of life. Call upon the name of the Lord. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for you. Call upon the name of the Lord. He'll have mercy upon you.